cord. Yo, Internet, welcome to TIG Radio number the 29. Uh, we missed a few weeks again, or a month? Something? No, we didn't. Oh, maybe. Um, I have hiccups, which doesn't bode well for live format. It's so we are, are, are joined this, this hour by um, John Graham and Jeffrey Rosen from Wolfire. They are the dudes oh God, behind the Indie Humble Bundle. Uh, hey, boys. So hey, how's it going? going? Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, no problem. So give us the, like the 30-second description of the bundle for anybody that's not aware of what the bundle is, which is probably nobody. <laughs> uh, go ahead, John. Uh, it's a pay-what-you-want plus charity promotion that uh, allows users to come to the site, and if they give a penny or more, they get access to five awesome indie games for PC, Mac, and Linux, and uh, by default are helping two awesome charities, Child's Play and the EFF. Um, and... In the Humble Bundle, too, there's also the Humble Tip option, which is something new we put in to uh, try to raise money to put on uh, future bundles like this. Nice. Um, so how many people have actually paid one penny? That is a good question. Last time, it was about uh, 9,000, I think. I don't know if we've crunched the numbers on this one yet. Oh, nice. But it was 9,000 out of 138,000 in Humble Bundle 1. So it'll be interesting to see if we're better or worse than that time. So th there's actually, a, I think, there was a tweet by, I guess, Jeff uh, asking if anybody had pirated the bundle to contact you, just out of curiosity. Has anybody contacted you, or do you guys have any idea wh why people would actually be pirating the bundle when you can just pay a penny? Uh, yeah. So a ton of people have contacted me. Originally, I put my email address out there, and they got, like, 65 emails but it was kind of frustrating because almost all of the emails were from people who didn't pirate it. And they just said, you know, I'm really mad that people are pirating it. I didn't pirate it. Or they'd say, you know, I didn't pirate it, but my friend pirated it. So I didn't actually get that much data from that. But then I put up a anonymous Google spreadsheets thing. And that's gotten like 500 responses or so. Oh, great. Um, and yeah, there's a few reasons why people have been pirating it so far. The first one is people in Turkey. Apparently, um, Google App Engine got censored in Turkey because there was some um, the YouTube lawsuit. Content. It's uh, this actually a separate thing. Basically, oh. like some some Google Docs thing had some kind of private data on it or copyright data, and then uh, one of the courts decided to take it down, but they accidentally took down the entire Google, ghs.google.com um, domain, which includes App Engine and a ton of other false positives. Holy crap. So I'm not, I'm not totally sure how accurate that is, but that's what one of the guys said in the, uh, in the anonymous forum that looked pretty legitimate. So, yeah, anybody from Turkey who goes to the Humble Bundle will get this weird-looking um, access denied page. Oh, oh, wow. How many people have said that they just don't have any kind of access, like, you know, they're 12 or 13 or 14, and don't have a credit card or, like, a PayPal account or anything like that? Yeah, that's another pretty popular one where they just say that, you know, my parents were not use their credit card, so <laughs> I had to pirate it. And that's... That's pretty legitimate. I mean, if you honestly cannot buy the bundle because you're too young, then I could see why somebody might pirate it. It still seems like you might be able to get someone to gift it on your behalf, though, for a penny. Right. Yeah, I definitely don't want to condone it. But if you just tweeted saying that you can't buy the bundle, explain why, I bet people would respond and somebody would gift it to you for yeah. at least a few dollars. Yeah, there's actually a thread on the Fun Motion forums, uh, and the Fun Motion forums are really quite young and um, 
somebody was offering to buy anybody who couldn't have like a PayPal account a bundle, and I, th I think he said he bought 25 gift codes, and I think he was doing it at like 10 cents a pop. So <laughs> you probably got in. I guess none of it at that point. Yeah, yeah, 10 cents is not too much, but you know, it's that's cool that they're at least trying to support us though. And I guess the other thing that really annoys me about the piracy is that, you know, if you can't buy it, then just go ahead and like email us and say, I can't buy the bundle. Can you, you know, help me out or give me a suggestion for how I could buy it? Don't just assume that we're not going to respond and then just pirate it immediately. You know, we do have the live chat widget on the site and we've answered about 7,000 chats so far in the past couple of days. Man. So we do have a lot of pretty good customer service, I think. How many like volunteers and people were actually manning the chats? Um, we have about 30 people who come in from time to time. At any given time, there's maybe one or two people on it. So it's, it's always crazy for whoever's doing it. But the way we can we do that is we just have like 30 people who are kind of on standby who check in when they can. Yeah, yeah. I was just on it this afternoon. It's, it's pretty fun. So I'm, I'm actually quite curious about the inception of the bundle because it seems like a lot of the bundle really is the story, like story in the marketing sense of it. Like it's called the humble bundle. You, you do have the, the funny images if you try to pay too less. It's mm -hmm. worded in such a way that it's not like we're starving indies and we're trying to make a little bit of scratch, but that's kind of the marketing story. And, I, and, and also like, like the charity angle. Um, I mean, you're, you're giving money to charity, but it kind of, in my mind, bleeds out a little bit in that giving money to indies at all is also kind of like a charity case. So like, how, how much of the original idea for the bundle was let's really hit on this sort of humble slash charity story and how much of it was just kind of came out of the fact that you decided to include charities? Um, I think it's, it's not so much that we're trying to like pull at the heartstrings of people. It's more so that we're just trying to create the most, um, the best possible deal in the world. Like you can literally pay one penny to a charity and get DRM free games and get it on steam for all platforms. And they may or may not go open source stuff like, like basically just keep layering on the awesomeness to the deal until you basically can't, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like it's, it's that awesome, but basically just remove any possible reason why somebody would not buy it. And that's kind of the idea of the bundle. Yeah. It, it seems to me like there's, it's really hard to have a reason not to, to open your wallet for some dollar amount. That's kind of amazing to me. It's like there, yeah, there's, really no reason unless you own absolutely all the games but even then that's kind of the convenience of well now i have like a steam activation for them or whatever it is Kudos. yeah that's why i was pretty curious about the the piracy like i just i basically want to make the bundle um accessible to everybody unless i unless you like truly do not like a single one of the games and you don't want to get on steam yeah the charities are not your favorite charities I mean, I, so, I bought the bundle and I just did like 100% to the charities because I've already paid people and, and like I've actually paid those game developers for their games. So I was like, <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll buy the bundle. I'll just hit all to charity. Yeah, and that's that's awesome. And the, uh, the EFF and Child's Player are really happy about that. It's basically just like win, 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 where it's just it's good for everybody. Yeah. So what what secrets are lined up for this bundle? I know like the last bundle was the the open source thing. Do you guys have any mega about this? <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've heard tell of some things, but only probably. Well, so the, the first, yeah, one problem is I teased the Steam keys on Twitter yesterday, which was kind of a mistake because I ended up really over-engineering the, uh, the whole Steam redeem feature. So it took me like, a, like 24 hours to actually implement that in a scalable way. So there are a lot of people on Twitter who are really mad about it surprise taking that long. Uh, so I don't want to give any promises, but we do have a couple other things lined up that um, I'll be working on right after this podcast. Nice, nice. Is it going to go open source again so someone can actually finish 
finish Cortex Command? Oh, bird. <laughs> All right. I, I, hey, whoa. Nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually don't really want to get into the whole Tick Source thread and Dan fighting his fans. <laughs> At least without Dan present, I guess I could call him. You pinged me on Skype. I didn't. I didn't see what was going on, but yeah, it's. Yeah. I think it's a sign of affection, though, too. It's because people really like the game. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm. I'm fond of saying that the opposite of love isn't hate; it's apathy. Like when when exactly. people don't care enough to even bitch about it is when you're you're really in shit shit up creek. It's like yeah, if if, if people are still dis- like if they're if they're vocally disappointed in the new build, it means they're still vocal about something. Like they're still paying attention to you. I don't know. That's how I live my love life. <laughs> yeah, Cortex Command is pretty unusual because normally in um, bundles, you'll usually see relatively old games. Like in the first Humble Bundle, all of those games were you know at least two years old. Um, but in this bundle, Cortex Command is not even finished yet. And Revenge of the Titans launched into the bundle itself. So I think you know a lot of people weren't really prepared for that, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Revenge of the Titans, also Braid, we launched the Linux version of Braid inside of the bundle. So there are a lot of support issues, but we managed to um, update those, update the builds. And That's kind of one of the interesting on things about the bundle too, is you get so many people moving through that it becomes really apparent uh, fairly quickly what, what deficiencies there might be. And then we can come right back to the developers and be like, hey, we're getting a lot of, you know, issues about this. Uh, let's find a fix for this. And then yeah. suddenly you can update the build and, and you've got, you're making the game better, faster um, because do you, do of the volume. Do you guys have stats on um, which people who buy the bundle download which games? Like what percent of people only download one game and which game that is or what percent of people have downloaded like all of the games? In theory, we should. Um, unfortunately, our... Content delivery provider, uh, Max CDN. Didn't they crap we, out? Yeah, they did. On the first day, they just they couldn't handle. I mean, I, I want I don't want to badmouth them or anything because they had a lot of other stuff going on at the same time. But because of like a bunch of stuff happening together. No, you should uh, you should throw them under the bus. I mean, that's their core competency is high traffic <laughs> bandwidth transfer. And it's like if if oh there was too much traffic for our CDN, like you failed. Yeah, it's, it was uh, kind of sad. So the main thing that happened to them is that Simple CDN went out of business, and every single one of Simple CDN's customers, my, they had like some deal with Max CDN where they all migrated to Max CDN. So on this day the bundle launched, Max CDN basically inherited another entire company's like uh, yeah. bandwidth in an emergency. So they had to. Switch us to like some new servers, but should be all good now. And actually, I have a plan to uh, combat this in the future, which I'm about to launch oh, nice. after the podcast. So just like mo- multiple download sources or some, some kind of failover? Well, I guess I can just reveal what it is, is that I'm going to add BitTorrent onto the site. Oh, nice. And not just like a regular torrent link that you see on the pirate bay but it actually is a web seed so our, our cdn will see the, the torrents in yeah, addition yeah. to the people so that, that was one of the things that a lot of pirates were mentioning in the google doc is that they just like BitTorrent better than direct downloads which is kind of surprising so i think if we add not just a, a regular torrent but like a web seeded torrents that should help a lot. Oh, so, someone actually just pasted a key into the chat. I... Oh, sad. Oh, well. Politeness fail. Ethical ethical quandary fail. <laughs> if you need the free games, they cost a dollar. Oh, goddamn people. Yeah, it, what's, what's funny about... Usually pirates are... are even when people like the games, people understand why the game is pirated. Like, you know, you know, Cortex Command was 20 bucks or whatever. But it's, it's funny that when it is down to a penny, people are like, you could have just asked me and I would have given you the penny. It's like it, piracy is suddenly no longer tolerated amongst any community because it's just like, you jerk, you asshole. Which is funny to me because you, you, usually pirates are kind of like, hey, thanks for the crack. You know, <laughs> now I don't have to die. buy this $50 game or, you know, I, it's not available in my region or whatever it is. It's just, it's, it's, it's weird. Yeah, it's amazing how many different kinds of pirates there are. 
And there are a lot of people who will just, you know, there are like the really, really hardcore pirates who just pirate absolutely everything for the sake of pirating it so they can have a 40 terabyte hard drive with just an archive of the internet. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. you know, that's pretty interesting. And <laughs> they, it's, it's hard to get too mad at some of them because uh, a lot of people who pirate it, you know, they're, they're, they're clearly doing it for archival purposes. Like they say that they download the games they didn't even play them. They just wanted to download them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I might as well reveal that way back in the day when Dreamcast was out, I actually I threw this binder away later, and I actually regret doing it. But I had actually had a binder of every Dreamcast game ever because Dreamcast didn't have – well, it, it, it had copy protection, but it was cir circumvented in a software way. So you could actually just download like an ISO and burn it, and it would just run on your Dreamcast. And I, I actually had every, including like Japanese dating games and like. These <laughs> but yeah, it, it, at that point, I would I would burn games and never play them. You know, I, I just I would collect, and I actually had at one point every Dreamcast release. There wow. was like 500 of them. It was these two 256 CD binders, but it, it was just a collection at that point. It was like stamp collecting. But anyway, college era. So I, I'm I'm gonna I'm actually curious. Uh, it wasn't covered too much in the press. I, I I think Crunch Gear picked up on it. The the fact that the new bundle was under Humble Bundle Inc. And you guys are now a Y Combinator company. And Y, y Combinator is a, a seed funding company that takes a very small stake in the company and then does batches of like 50 companies uh, twice a year. And they funded companies like Dropbox and Justin.tv and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm actually curious about that. Like what – what can you guys say about that or not much yet? Sure. Um, well, basically we're going to, we're taking the humble bundle very seriously and it's basically our full time job to run humble bundle. And this is just the, uh, I guess the second of many to come. And we have a lot of interesting ideas about <laughs> digital distribution that we're going to experiment with. So, so basically we started this company. And nice. the reason we did Y Combinator is just because, you know, if you're starting a company, I feel like Y Combinator is kind of a no-brainer. Like, if you apply and you actually get accepted, that instantly will increase your valuation and it's just kind of increases your odds of success dramatically. Yeah. So that's why we did Y Combinator. I also think it means people will treat you more fairly because they know that there's like a, a, a network behind you. So if they offer you terms, they know you're going to at least run the terms by PG or by like the alumni network. And it's harder to, I guess, get taken advantage of. Yeah, definitely. I can't comment too much about my commenter yet just because it hasn't really started. But I'm look, really looking forward to the program. Nice. Yeah, I'm actually quite curious to talk to you guys after you go through it, just to hear kind of firsthand that because the they do those weekly talks, but they're always off the record, uh, you know, so people can actually talk more freely about the mistakes they've made and kind of what they think about their company. But I mean, not to to hear like verbatim, but I'm just curious because I've, I've never actually talked to anybody in in person that has gone through the program. So yeah, yes, yeah, it should be pretty interesting. So is 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 you, who's going through the actual program? Is it is it both of you or is it you and David? Oh uh, yeah, it's just John and myself. Nice. I am very curious to see how that comes out, and also very curious to hear your um, independent game summit lecture, which we should talk at some point. Oh yeah, we'll have a little bit more to talk about now. Yeah, I the, the application I, I could only mention Humble Bundle One, but uh, we figured that we would have a little bit more to say by the time it came around in March, or I, is it February? Like it's February twenty. It's like yeah, February twenty eighth to March, whatever. Uh, and then, yeah, there's a half an hour Humble Bundle talk for all of our savvy listeners who will be at GDC. <laughs> yeah, I would. I mean, personally, I, I would love to see just a graphs, like a lot of graphs and the price breakdown and kind of... All data? Uh, yeah, just whip through ridiculously awesome charts. So with the bundle stuff, are you guys going to be focused on the game industry or, or is it going to be, would you consider a, in like an application bundle or like a game <laughs> development application bundle? Or, it's a very um, interesting question, and uh, I think somehow it seems like that, that's one of the things we want to test. The first, the second Humble Bundle was kind of like answering the question, was the first one just a fluke, or yeah. could this kind of thing happen again? And it seems like the answer is in the 
in the gaming space, especially for indie games, it's 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 full of uh, awesomeness, as Jeff was saying, for everybody involved. Um, but that would be something we'd be interested in testing. Maybe is you know seeing if there are other industries or or sectors that that uh, could also um, util utilize this kind of a, a monetization mechanic, I guess. Yeah, and in in my mind, what especially if you can compare the Humble Indie Bundle to all these other bundles that have appeared in the last year, which I guess I should get your official opinion on. But um, I think the difference is the, the technological savvy you guys have makes the checkout process just insanely buttery smooth. Like the real-time stats, the checkout, you know, waiting for the PayPal stuff to report back. Everything about it is so ridiculously polished, and I think that's the advantage that you guys have, and you can take that advantage to you know, other markets or other sort of opportunities. So yeah, and what what is what is your like official stance on the numerous other philanthropic bundles that have appeared in the last year? Um, Polite I'm, acceptance. I'm just, <laughs> well, yeah, we, I mean, we don't own the the uh, the concept of giving to charity or anything. I'm kind of surprised that the other bundles are so bad. Like that sounds kind of mean but i feel like if you're gonna you know try to copy somebody's idea where you're not coming up with your own idea so literally the only thing that matters is execution you really should you know at least try to make the checkout process work make it so people don't need to sign up for multiple accounts on your system and you know add all this friction to this stuff and the thing i'm really surprised though is the some of these bundles actually get it for some pretty um, relatively well-known indies to sign up, and I don't. Yeah. I think it's it's kind of dangerous for like I don't I don't want to sound like a a humble bundle mogul, but if you're going to um, put your game pay what you want with you know some other person who makes you two hundred dollars in your bundle then it makes it harder for you to do that later on in a, you know, a more high profile one. Like you can't, can't go into another Steam sale or a Humble Bundle or so on. It just kind of yeah, yeah. messes up your brand without actually getting the rewards of doing it. Yeah, and even if you use Cortex Command as an example, um, only because I actually saw that Dan did this today, he even posted a link in his forums to the bundle build. So in addition to the bundle, he basically posted a DRM-free link to his game, and I, I kind of worry about that hurting him in the long term, or at least until he releases you know, beta 25 in another two years. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me that... Um, I don't know. Do, do, you, do you feel like the bundle will necessarily be kind of end of life games? I guess in in, the, in bundle two, it's you know if you're launching a game into the bundle, it's quite different than you know a game that's been out in the market. Like the first bundle was games that had kind of launched a year or two previous. Do you feel like the bundle has is it, will be an opportunity for people to launch their games, or do you think it'll kind of be more appropriate for? Developers um, yeah, I think you can definitely. I mean, so Revenge of the Titans launched into the bundle. And that's doing very well for them. Um, they've made enough money to uh, continue to be a full-time indie. And it's a pretty cool story that I think uh, Caspian is going to blog about where, you know, they were having a lot of trouble paying the bills and so on for a while. And now with this bundle, you know, they're a successful indie developer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so to, uh, continue developing. Kaz has been around for a long time. I mean, he he was around in the Dexterity forums and then like the Indie Gamer forums, um, and I guess he had a little bit of a foray into the Tig Source forums. But we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> so it, there's there's been some critique. Um, I don't think there's been a very focused critique in terms of people writing large editorials, but I've seen some comments on Twitter uh, that people worry about bundles in general and kind of pay what you want sales that individual developers are doing. And even, I guess, like the big Steam sales kind of send the message that indie games 
aren't really worth their full price cost and maybe you should wait for a bundle or maybe you should wait for like a you know anniversary sale or something do, do, do you guys worry about that do, do you talk about that or is it something that you think doesn't really apply to the bundle there's a lot of factors in play um and i i mean i i understand the the devaluing argument um but it's i guess the truth is though for indies that the internet is not one giant cohesive pool so just because you um you know do a promotion here you're not going to get everybody to hear about the promotion over there um so it, for indies it tends to be the case that their biggest problem is that people don't know they exist and by doing something like this you kind of maximize awareness and so i think it's i think it ends up being like as an indie that, that was kind of one of the things we were always thinking about with, with overgrowth and stuff that um, you want you want people to find out about you, so you you can afford to be wild and crazy, uh, and if you're not successful, nobody hears about it, and if you are successful, uh, you should be able to support yourself a little bit from the uh, results. So, yeah, I do That's, feel like it's it's pretty awesome um, to see that the bundle can get like a hundred thousand people, and you, you, you like now have their emails. You now have probably some way to contact them. Um, I guess there's that checkbox like, hey, do you want us to contact you again? But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 that, and it's also kind of blowing my mind just how large Minecraft has gotten in terms of a platform that's actually owned by by essentially one person. I mean, he's got other people underneath him now, but yeah, yeah, it's tremendous. Yeah, it's it it warms my heart to see indies starting to kind of kind of own the trains, like to actually own the in infrastructure that they're using to to reach their audience, as opposed to having to rely on you know Steam and other platforms that essentially. You, you like don't get the customer email. You you don't get direct cu customer contact, and a lot, I, th I think a lot of the goodwill even ends up going towards Valve or, I guess not really Microsoft for XBLA. I don't think people really consider that. <laughs> yeah, app, app stores are a little bit scary because if you're if you're a winner and you're on the featured whatever, uh, you're making a killing, but you have no real way to recapture that. It's a crapshoot the next time, and yeah. you're at the, the whim of the. The platform you're on to to uh, promote you, yeah, so. yeah. We, we we actually launched um or submitted four Blurse games into the Mac App Store, which launches January sixth. Uh, but for for me, that's actually kind of because I I think those games are only worth like three dollars, and I I don't think you can sell something for three dollars on the open internet. I don't think people will open their wallet and do a transaction for something that's three or four dollars. But I do think that in an iTunes like environment or like an App Store environment where it's a single click, I think you can charge a lot less. So that's kind of exciting for me, but it's also because like the Blurse games are quite old now, and it's the same thing. It's like if, if there's some way that we can monetize them without having to do a, a whole bunch of work, then it's it's great for us. And uh, Apple actually emailed us about getting some promotional assets for Blush. So if all goes well, they'll actually you know give it that magical feature that will give us exposure, so we don't get buried underneath. But I actually can't imagine how many uh, Mac games they're going to have. I mean, it's like are they going to have all 73 Mac games? Cause there really aren't, aren't that many. I need to get Lugaru on there. Yeah, it only took us a day to to modify our our build process to include the App Store. It'll be interesting to see how it competes with Steam. Yeah, I think it it'll probably actually be more more popular in a lot of like to do apps because I I think the Mac app ecosystem is not. I mean, there are a lot of small little apps that are great, and I think that'll be really good for, for Mac. Because, I mean, Apple doesn't make a whole bunch of software, and there's not a whole bunch bundled with Macs. I think everybody's going to want to get the latest and greatest, you know, a sort of RSS reader thing, Twitter client thing, like to-do list reminder thing, and I think that'll help out. But App Store is horrible for indie devs. Well, yeah, I guess it depends how you... Yeah. How you the feel. other crazy thing that's probably on the horizon is one day Apple is going to say, hey... Uh, unless you jailbreak your Mac computer, you can only get stuff through the App Store. I feel like that's that's kind of the the writing on the wall that uh, yeah. is a, maybe three or four years out. Jeff and I were kind of talking about that uh, a few months ago, but that seems to be this is the first step towards that, where they want to get the same control over the the personal computer ecosystem that yeah. they have for the iPhone and other things. Yeah, like the the. Part of me is is 
like philosophically outraged at that. And the other part of me, the, the part of me that stopped building computers years and years ago and stopped like doing hardcore tinkering and just wanted something to work and work well, that part of me is, is totally complacent. I, I would be fine yeah. with that. I, I, wouldn't I think a lot, really of consumers, a lot of consumers aren't hardcore. They will prefer the app store probably. Yeah. I mean, he, However, uh, keep in mind that if that happens, you can't have a humble bundle on the Mac anymore. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I do think that it, it, it will limit things. And like you, you couldn't even have you know something more like a Minecraft. Um, but I mean, like if, if I look at what programs I'm running at any given moment, it's always like Chrome, iTunes, and like Skype and ADM. That's basically my workflow yeah. when, I, when I'm not doing like development. Like I, yeah. I, and I feel like years ago it used to be more programs. Maybe I just remember it being more programs, but I don't know. It's just like more and more stuff, I guess, is just happening in the browser. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all, what's, what's your guys' take on like the, the Chrome Web Store and Chrome OS actually launching with their laptop reasonably soon? Uh, do, you, do you feel like this, the, the, that's an actual valid or, I, I guess, lucrative opportunity for indies, or do you, do you feel like it's just Chrome and Google just testing the waters? Um, well, I'm a big fan of HTML5 and open web technologies, but I'll also be the first to admit that they're pretty limited in what you can do. Yeah. So it will be a while before, you know, even like Luguru could run efficiently on something like that. It will happen eventually, though. But it's yeah. going to take quite a while for that. Have you guys been following the native client stuff at all or not? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, is that um, in, in the latest Chrome OS yet? I have no idea uh, I'm on, a, on its time frame. I, I think it's supposed to be out at some point, like summer maybe. I don't know. I actually feel like that's really, really sneaky on, on, on Google's part. I feel like because if you, if you support native client, uh, your stuff will run sort of automatically on Mac, Windows, Linux, but I feel like it'll also begin to run on the next Android phones, the next Android tablets, the next Google TV stuff. It's kind of their way of like write once, run anywhere, sort of, but I'm not too clear on how portable it is without work on the developer. So yeah, that I don't know. Pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that from from our perspective, I mean, we just use... Um, I, you, Unity is going to support it in their web player alongside their actual web player plugin. So for us, it's just going to be automatic as long as we keep developing with Unity. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what the pipeline will be like for anybody that's going to roll their own. <laughs> clickety, clickety, click. Sweet. Well, if you have to bail, Jeff, you can bail, then we'll, we'll wrap up the show. Yeah, right. I got to send out those emails about the Steam keys. Yeah, and Jeff, get back to work, will you? Uh, work on some new secret features for the bundle. So if you guys are full-time on the bundle, who's working on Overgrowth? Well, it's one of the... Yeah, it's sort of just putting different labels on what we've already been doing. Um, David and Aubrey have always been the powerhouses behind Overgrowth, and Jeff and I have been tangentially trying to help out and make, make things easier when possible. But in terms of the direct development, that's that's been David and Aubrey. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's definitely uh, restructuring the bullfire, which makes a ton of sense because, you know, like for the past six months, I have barely touched the overgrowth source code, but I've been working a ton on the Humble Bundle. So this just kind of restructures how everything works in a <coughs> way that everybody's happy with. Nice. Sweet. Well, I will let you bail, and then we can just wrap up the show with John real quick. And that's right. Well, I, I guess we could feel. Here. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Good. Have a good one, man. So we'll probably end the show a little bit um, early, but and before we do, uh, we can try to directly field questions from the chat, which has actually been quite active. So, chat people, hit us up with questions. Any of us, uh, though Ben is not talking because he is a werewolf. <laughs> where, did, where did this come from? Well, when a man and a photo of the girl on the internet love each other very much. Yeah. Hey, damn it, Ben disconnected again. What is up with this connection? 
Okay, well, the chat doesn't have any compelling questions. Oh, how much money does someone actually have to pay before the Humble Bundle gets something? Is it? I think with PayPal, it's what, like 34 cents or something? Something like that. I think it's just under a dollar on most of the payment processors. Jeff could give you the official amount, but basically if you're giving a dollar or more, a little bit is actually making it to uh, making it through the payment processors. Nice. Have you guys thought about having um, advanced sliders where you can change the sliders per game, or do you feel like that kind of ruins? We thought about that, but we were worried about slider overload, and if we had put sliders for every single game, I think the UI would have been a little bit more intimidating, and uh, it might have made things a little bit too complicated, but we, we definitely considered that. And then you end up with interesting stats about a, the popularity contest, I guess, yeah, between yeah. games, which... It's probably uncomfortable for some people. So yeah, I'm I'm actually quite curious what the popularity contest is already with with the downloads. If you guys get that information, yeah. Well, I'll try to uh, try to look into that, and hopefully, maybe I can. That's something I can include in the talk. Sweet. Uh, there's a question, Ben, for you and me. If we're working full time on Astes, by an anonymous Ustreamer. Um, ben is working full time right now, and I'm I'm going to work on it probably about a week uh, a week per month. The screenshot that we released the other day was, I think about. 10 days of my programming time and then like years of Ben's time. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> this is something like that. Uh, awesome, bro. And somebody asked about Dan's actions. The person who asked about Dan's actions, I'm assuming, um, has followed the Tig Source thread. And I feel like I've said the stuff that I actually want to publicly berate Dan about in that thread. So yeah, just read the Tig Source thread. God damn it. Ben keeps disconnecting. Huh. What is up with that? Uh, Dan, Dan Tabar is the developer behind Cortex Command, and he's been working on it for 10 years. Uh, this question, if there'll be Steam Desura codes from day one in the next bundle? Um, maybe. We, uh, it just depends. You know, Steam's awesome. Um, and sometimes they answer their email really fast. Sometimes they've got a lot going on and they they uh, don't uh, have a chance. But to be fair, we, we didn't we didn't give them uh, a huge head start on this one, and uh, they came through real fast anyway. So we're we're amazed, and it's they're they're awesome guys. That's really awesome. How many people like work on Steam from Valve? I always have the sense that it's kind of like a smaller team than you might expect. Yeah, I feel like it's it's they keep it lean and mean, and those guys just have to deal with everything all the time. And uh, I think they, I'm sure they're doing an amazing job with it. I I can only imagine because they how many games are there on Steam now? They I think they've got thousands of titles, right? So yeah, it's some crazy ass number. And just dealing with the customer support for uh, our own little bundle here, you know, multiply that by 25 million active users or whatever it is, and suddenly <laughs> you've got a lot on your hands. So, yeah. So there's a question in here: How did the developers you contacted initially respond to being in the bundle? I'm going to assume they are this, this guy or girl. I say he's talking about the first bundle because I think the second bundle was just like, oh, I would also like a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so the. For the first bundle, there were a few things going on. We uh, we had this vision that hopefully independent developers could reach out directly to consumers and and promote themselves. And the first experiment we did was the organic indie pre-order pack with the awesome guys at Unknown Worlds. Yeah. We combined Natural Selection 2 with Overgrowth. Uh, both games were in development and only available for pre-order. We made the uh, option available to pre-order them together for less than they would cost individually. And that little promotion did quite well. Um, and then other things were going on, like uh, for World of Goo's birthday, the 2D Boy guys just did a straight up pay what you want promotion, and that went really well for them. So we got thinking, you know, how could we tap into something like this on a larger scale and, uh, and make something, you know, happen like this again? And uh, we contacted Ron. Ron was the first developer we talked to, and, um, you know, we had lunch and, and just threw ideas in the air and mixed it up and I think he was since he had already done the pay what you want promotion he was uh, fairly willing to to give it a try again within the context of a bundle um, so it wasn't like you know fresh out of the blue um, going crazy it was uh, well maybe we can try this again in a new context and, and, and maybe it'll work and then once once we had sort of Ron's blessing 
I think it was easier to, to follow up with the other developers. But they basically, <laughs> we found an awesome group of developers who were all our friends and uh, were willing to give us the benefit of the doubt on this crazy experiment. So we owe them a lot of appreciation for that. Nice. If you ever do a uh, bundle of bundles, I'd be happy to give you the Blurse bundle pack. Although I guess we don't have Linux support. <laughs> yeah, we so far, I mean, we we tried to make that a prerequisite just because um, throughout Wolfire's history, supporting Mac and Linux has been awesome. But um, I bet there's some way to to we can figure that out. Let's, I mean, let's talk more uh, after the after the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. There, there there actually is like a Linux port uh, going on, but I don't know kind of what its time frame is. Who who uses Linux as their primary OS? Like you're you're zero point zero percent of the internet. Yeah, I I, I mean I I will confess I don't even know how to boot Linux up on a computer, but um, the numbers don't lie. You can see that you know Linux users are always the most generous and uh, they're they're pretty noisy and uh, and if you support them they want to support you. So. Yeah, yeah, I do feel like that they're. All, it, it, it's it's a good story for sites like Ars Technica and Slashdot and other places that have fair amounts of traffic and love things like Linux. Anarchists. Anarchists. <laughs> Linux. Yeah, the, one of the interesting stats, we haven't had a chance to share it, but from the from the uh, first bundle is we had the the split evenly button, the all the developers and all the charity buttons, and then there was the customize option. And I think Linux users were twice as likely to choose the customize option as uh, other users. So huh. um, it kind of, I think, coincides with their belief about operating systems should be customable, customizable. They want to they wanna micromanage what they do. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that carried into the stats we saw a little bit. Do enough people modify those sliders to have any difference from the default, or is the default kind of what happens in the average? Uh, that we're not ready to uh, spill the beans on, on the numbers yet, but um, I think the defaults are important. Um, we're seeing that they, they, the behind the scenes accumulating stats are, are very similar to the default settings. Yeah. Not identical, but similar. Yeah, I'm sure it probably drifts a little bit by, by platform. Um, do, have you guys done any A-B testing like on this bundle, or do you plan to in the future? We really want to because there's it would just there are so many awesome experiments you could come up with, um, and we hope maybe we can get one of those in. But uh, I think we might have to save the the really exciting stuff for future bundles. Yeah. So it's, people have asked actually like a, a couple times if you guys have any idea on the regularity or frequency of the bundles at all. Yeah. Um, they asked me this in the interview on Indie Games with uh, Tim W. and Mike Rose. Uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean, we have two data points directly now um, in terms of humble indie bundles. But if you look at guys like at Steam, basically, they have a sale all the time, every time, it seems. And it's always getting upvoted on Reddit. So it, it, it kind of yeah. feels like every day is theoretically a good day for a game sale uh, as long as you can get the word out. So it's it's kind of... It's kind of a crazy environment. Um, someone had a comment. The average payments are going down since adding Steam keys. I feel like that's probably fairly random. Could be, or it could be that um, Steam users are coming in and uh, wanting to activate these games and not wanting to pay us for it, just getting their quick key and getting out. It's hard to hard to know. Nice. But I think if we looked at the rates of uh, contributions, that it's probably up overall um, in light of the Steam keys, even if uh, more people are coming in and giving less. But yeah, we'll have to look at the numbers. Has Valve actually talked about it anywhere? I guess they, they kind of run, run like the Steam powered blog. Um, I don't know if they're, they're giving it any press. I think probably they see the Humble Indie Bundle as a great way to build their active user base. And um, are just want us to do the legwork without getting tangled up in yeah, yeah. Um, any of the PR stuff. Do you guys have any idea? I, I guess you're probably running it, analytics on like the actual website, but who are your top referrers in terms of traffic? Like uh, A, just the obvious ones, and then B, like what sent you a lot of traffic that you just didn't even expect or have on your? Oh, um, I think Reddit is the 
the easily the biggest. And uh, then runners up are, I think, Ars Technica and Kotaku. Uh, and the surprise ones, I don't I haven't looked at the data um, in depth enough to give you one of those. But th I think those are the big three: Reddit, Reddit, Ars, and uh, Kotaku. Nice. Uh, have you have you guys thought about supporting affiliates at all in the future in terms of uh, encouraging people to, to actually send you traffic, or is that just kind of like a logistical nightmare that you don't really want to get into? It is a little messy, um, but we have considered it, and it seems like when you have so many awesome um, indie gaming friendly eyeballs landing on a site, there should be a lot of opportunities to to cross pollinate with other indies. So. Um, that's definitely something we would we would want to explore a little bit, and uh, whether it's referrals from the site back to other indies or referrals from indies to the site, I think there's there's ecosystems there that need to get established, maybe. Nice. I'm trying to read read the chat for more questions, but every fifth question is a query and gish on Steam. <laughs> and that's a uh, question. Like, yeah, so, you should you should ask um, Alex sure. Austin and Alec Coloca people from the chat. Like, they. We def yeah, we've definitely uh, not you know made your request known to Steam and the other developers. It's just a matter of you know, can pe do people have time to do it and are they allowed to do it? Um, but yeah, it's currently Steam doesn't have Aquaria and Gish on Mac. But we fixed the uh, Penumbra Overture problem. That is now uh, Mac users can activate Penumbra Overture. Nice. Yeah, the people in the chat, you should be aware that many Mac ports for games are actually funded by Mac publishers. And sometimes even the developer will not have the rights to put that Mac version somewhere else. Um, so like if a, if a Mac retail publisher funds the Mac port of a game, then they probably can't, the developer probably can't put that game on Steam. So yeah, now you are aware of that problem. So who who are your like I guess it's kind of a trick question, but who are your um dream games for any bundle in the future? Um regardless of if you're actually in contact with them or you know who would you like to see on the on the bundle? Um let me see. Well, I uh I don't know if I have a definite list assembled yet, but um I've heard a lot of awesome things. I've gotten to play the demo of Super Meat Boy, but uh I haven't uh, gotten to play through the whole thing, but I think that would be a fun one. Uh, of course, uh, Minecraft is cross-platform compatible, but they're their own institution, so I don't know if they they would want to do a wild and crazy uh, bundle. But um, there are some other... There's an interesting one. It was like a large but still sort of indie uh, company, S2, I think, Heroes of New Earth. That's an yeah. interesting cross-platform uh game, but I, I'm sure I'm going to draw a blank on others that are... Oh, Akron. It's kind of cool. I think that's cross-platform. It's the time-traveling RTS. It's still in development, though, I believe. Um, I'm just spouting from the top of my head, but... Um, yeah, the, the, the chat's going a little bit crazy, too, which is awesome. Um, and then, actually, uh, Mike had a question from the chat. Um, if the, the bundle model was kind of inspired by, or if you guys have referenced the model of, of tours on... on music where bands that might have like a loose affiliation or like a label affiliation will get together and do a tour to kind of benefit everybody or have you guys not re like was was the one model inspired by that or is it more just sort of naturally i think radiohead was an inspiration because they they directly did the pay what you want but in terms of of tours it's sort of an an old principle that um you know each each ip or band or product or whatever has its own uh community fan base etc and that by doing a bundle, a tour, a grouping of all those things, like or the movie The Expendables, <laughs> uh, you you end up putting everybody's brand together in a way that you know cross pollinates and creates a super awesome event that that uh, helps everyone even more than they would would be helped by just trying to do something on their own. So that's it's an old paradigm, I and mean, we can't say we we created that. It's it's classic uh, yeah. marketing, I guess. And it's. Also, kind of like you, you have like the big opening or like the, the sort of like the headliner act, and then like the opening acts where it, it feels like every bundle so far has had a really strong headliner, where it was World of Goo or it was Braid, and then it's yeah. kind of like and the opening acts are these games that you might not have heard of, but maybe you should check it out. Yeah, no, there's definitely there's definitely some of that going on too, and it, it seems like an, 
uh, maybe a mechanism for um, the generous established guys to help the, the newcomers um, if they're willing to participate. It's kind of a, a way to keep everybody going strong on yeah. all sectors of the indie space. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is true that, uh, it's, especially for games that launch in the bundle, it's like 100% a, a of the, their, their, their money will be from the bundle, whereas a game like Braid, I mean, I'm sure it's a much smaller percent uh, yeah. of the, the total Braid revenue is going to come from the bundle. Yep, and one of the things, I mean, it was very generous of John to, to partake. One of the things that he really liked about it was the, the charity aspect, uh, that we were probably going to be able to raise a lot of money for charity, and yeah. uh, he made that clear when I... When I first talked to him, we the first uh, Humble Bundle 2 conversation with another developer happened, I think, at E3 um, when we were both at the uh, that game company uh, party. Nice. So it was kind of cool. So what what's your personal prediction for Humble Bundle 2, like total dollar amount? Um, well, Is we like have a, a couple surprises, so... I I don't want to jinx anything, but I think I think we can exceed the first bundle um, by maybe I would guess rough guess forty percent, fifty percent. That's my that's what I'm I'm feeling right now. But we'll just have to see. There's a lot of factors in play, and uh, we'll have to see how much people like the uh, the, the surprises. You guys should have a add a form to to your purchase page, like your key page, or you can type in a number uh, for your prediction, and the person <laughs> person that's closest without going over wins yeah. another bundle. I don't know what they would win. We really need, uh, I think, a f just putting forums in general on the the bundle site would be great because usually super users are figuring out issues, especially on Linux. You know, everybody's distro is a little bit different, and they have to tweak this or you know make the oh, directive God, yeah. this way to get it to work. So if we could just create a site where all these people could share this information with each other in a useful way, then it would, uh, I think it would help distribute the information uh, more easily. Right now, I, you know, when we, we man the live chatter, I answer emails, I hear all these problems, and then when somebody posts a fix to me, I put it in our, our chat, uh, or like we have like a chat helper page where all the customer support people can look at the solutions, and then we kind of distribute them one at a time but, uh, and I've heard, I think this was from Ron, actually, when he launched World of Goo, that people don't like FAQs. You can post the FAQ. No one's going to read it. And no one but reads anything. Some, yeah. But somehow with forums, people actually do um, hmm. check and find out a lot of the time and uh, consolidate information in useful ways. So I think I, I would... I agree with you that forums need to be added. Yeah, point. it's it's funny how when you feel like you're talking to somebody, especially in, in, in real time, like this chat is probably, I don't know, 20 pages of printed text at this point, and I've read all of it, and I'm sure a lot of people in the chat have read all of it. But it's like even if it weren't live, nobody would go read through the chat. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's like as it, it, you get closer and closer to I'm engaged with the human, you will just read more and more text. Yeah. Huh. Is it worth to get a game ported? Yeah, Linux Linux ports suck. Uh, and are questionably worth it, but I guess it's also like there are so few games on Linux that it's probably worth it. Yeah, you, we Jeff did a post about this a while ago. Why you should support Mac OS X and Linux, and we found that by supporting Mac and Linux historically with Luguru sales, with the bundles, whatever, uh, we've gotten twice the revenue uh, yeah. we normally would have. So I've heard, I think, I've heard that before too. Yeah, when you're in the indie space, I think. I think it makes a, a lot of sense for you, just because you get. Yeah, uh, I think the Mac and Linux communities are are noisy and friendly and willing to get the word out if you reach out to them, and you get to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. Like you were mentioning, there there are several factors in play that that, that make that a good idea. I think for indies. Yeah, I, I I feel like I might get a little bit, I mean, better and worse at the same time. Worse because I think there's there's going to be more Mac Mac ports with Steam and with the Mac App Store. Uh, yeah. But better for the for the actual gamer. Um, for the actual Mac Mac gamer, but I feel like for as, as a developer, the the opportunity of being one of the few Mac ports is probably going to wane in the next year or two. It's true. It's a changing space, and the big players are moving into the Mac scene. Yeah, and it, it's actually great that that Blizzard has StarCraft two, and then um, Valve has Steam. The, the Mac or Apple's actually been pushing in graphic updates now, like graphic driver fixes. Oh it's, yeah, I heard about that. Like the the same hardware booted to Windows will perform much, much better than the same hardware Mac OS just because the Mac OS drivers are just total shit. Yep. 
So hopefully the pressure will fix it. Well, we have four minutes left if the chat has any burning, burning questions for the show. There's so much noise. Oh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very, fairly... I actually could turn off the, the guest speaking. You think any favoring blogs like Rock Paper Shotgun helps or hinders indie game growth? Um, I believe it helps. Yeah, that would be my argument, too. Indies need help getting the word out. And the more sites willing to cover them is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, well, exposure of things that are cool is a little bit different from things that will actually make money. Like Rock Paper Shotgun talked about every Blurst game that we ever launched, uh, but Blurst never had a very compelling sort of money-making model behind it, so it didn't automatically make us rich or anything. Uh, <clears throat> but it was certainly awesome to have the critical acclaim out there. And people keep asking, yeah, overgrowth and bundle ever. I, I feel like that's, well, I'm not going to answer for you, but I feel like it's kind of an obvious question. <laughs> I heard things. I heard things. Will you ever leverage the platform you own to monetize the game that you own? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> hey, are you ever going to like kiss your girlfriend and maybe like <laughs> and stuff? Like, I don't know, man. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I heard things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, were you on drugs? Actually, I'm also quite curious about the the humble indie bundle two video. Okay. It's really frenetic. Like it's 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 crazy. Uh, someone was asking if you were on drugs when you made it. Like, was there a yeah. bit, let's make this just a really crazy video? So the 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 first people have I've been getting mixed reactions. Some people like say the second video is better. Some people say the first video is way better. The first one was very disciplined and orderly, and the the cadence you know I adhered to the 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 wrapping framework or whatever you want to call it in a very tidy way. And uh, the second one, I was like, well, I can't just do that again. And I, I, kept, I kept hopelessly falling back to basically the first video for the format. And I was like, well, I need to convey all the same information again, but I don't want to bore people to tears. So let's, let's come up with something a little bit different. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that footage was something I had recorded two years ago at uh, sailing training uh, in, in Florida with the co my college sailing team, like, it was just, I, 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 I kept iterating off random stuff, and uh, once I had the space shuttle launch in there, I was like, well, what if I could kind of make radio voices the motif, and um, I don't know, you want, you want the start of the video to be kind of catchy, and the, the start of the, the first Humble Bundle video was kind of slow and, and regular, so I, I thought we should get some Arnold and, and Sean Connery early on in, in this video, and I don't know. I just I, I kept it free form and, and hopefully surprising so that the video wall conveying the information was still entertaining. That was my that was my aim. So I think it worked. Needs more boobs. <laughs> yeah. That's my that's my viral video tip. Yeah, this is hot girl just working out on her weed. She's totally not a viral marketing firm or anything. You could have just used that for the thumbnail, right? <laughs> I, I, I bet we would have gotten so many more organic YouTube referrals if we had just had a nice cleavage shot as the thumbnail, but <laughs> wouldn't have been appro appropriate, probably. Would or wouldn't have? Would not. What about have. all the gay users, gay males? <laughs> what do you believe needs to be changed about mainstream gaming? Actually, mainstream gaming. Maybe you've answered your own question with your typo. Um, Interesting. I, I. It needs to have. Well, I, yeah, with a lot of modern stuff. There's, for example, there's like two types of chickens that we now eat as humans when it used to be like we would eat thousands of different types of birds. Yeah, there needs to be less homogenization, more design for design's sake, and less genre templates. I will answer it with the number of chickens we eat. That was, that was a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Where can we, is this guy has to ask this question like three times. Where can we find consistent PWYW games? What is PWYW? Hey, about? what you want games. Oh, I just want to know where else those are. Google it. Christ. Yeah, put up a Google News alert. I know. I think uh, the Yama guys are doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, of course, my best advice would be to uh, keep, your, keep your eyes on HumbleBundle.com. Uh, or Twitter.com slash Humble. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there probably won't be any more Blurs games. Never again, no, ever. Um, I'd actually like to do some small games at some point, and we're going to port some of our Blurs stuff to iOS. But... I don't think we'll do anything under the Blur's brand. I think we might do some small games that we release to the Mac App Store and the iOS App Store and the web. Um, Blur's games are awesome, but making something every eight weeks and putting it out for free on the internet is not a good way to make money. 
I don't know who is you on that partnering with. All right, well, the hour's up. Oh, and Ben was dropped again. I'll bring him back on so he can say goodbye. Well, let me quick recap with Ben. That is total crap. All right, welcome back, Ben. Just in time for the end of the show. Yep, sorry. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> well, thank you, John, for joining us for the hour, and thanks to Jeffrey, who has already left us. Thanks for having us, guys. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, man. TIG Radio is run sometimes weekly. Uh, it's sometimes with Tommy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Tommy was summoned by Lord, Lord Newell to Seattle. Um, oh, your hosts nice. are myself, Matthew Wagner, Ben Reese, Tommy Reffin is. Uh, TIG Radio website by Kyle Pulver. TIG Radio theme song by Danny Baranowski. Uh, go by the Super Meat Boy soundtrack. And TIG Radio is proudly sponsored by absolutely no one. And maybe see you guys next week. All right, later.